The worst type of illness is one which lives within the mind, one that makes you both the victim and the offender at the same time, and one that prevents you from blaming anything or anyone else because the only person you have to blame is yourself. This, this is what having an eating disorder is like. You see, society fails to credit mental illness. When a person breaks their leg, it is taken care of immediately. However, when a person has an illness that is not physically visible, not understood, and even for some non-existent, it is disregarded. Ironically, you can live without a leg, but you can't live without a mind or a body. So, what if you had an eating disorder? What if you think you might? What if your friend has one? My name is Alexa Kalich, and it is an honor to be speaking to you today at TEDx Youth at ESF 2019. <laughs> the illness I struggled with is known as anorexia. The medical term is anorexia nerviosa, and contrary to the popular belief that society has about eating disorders, you don't have to look a certain way or weigh a certain amount to have an eating disorder. In my case, my illness was present since kindergarten. I recall my sixth birthday. It was two years before first grade. My teeth had fallen shortly before that, so my smile in pictures only appears half full. My mom had planned the whole thing. She rented huge inflatables, got my favorite cake, and sent out all the invitations. And together with the rest of the planning came my outfit. I was all about being cool at the time, so I had ordered that a special black tank top with an electric guitar be made to fit for the special occasion. So I remember on the day of the party, putting on my black tank top and my white skirt and going up to the mirror. I was the only one in the room at the time, but it wasn't only me looking in the mirror. A voice in the back of my head pointed to my bloated tummy and my fat legs. It told me my friend, who was wearing the exact same thing as I had, looked better than me. It told me to stand up straight and keep my stomach in for the rest of the day. I was six years old. In the years following my sixth birthday, I grew. And with every inch I grew, my insecurities degraded together with it. The voice was there every time I tried on things in the clothing room of the store, every time we had swimming lessons in school, and every time I looked at myself in the mirror. The comments from my fifth grade bully fed it, and my so-called friends of the time took advantage of it. My body was never good enough for them, and I was never good enough for myself. Night after night, I came home and cried into my mom's shoulder, soaking my pink flowered pajamas with tears. And even then, even when she told me that I was the most beautiful girl in the world, and that these other girls were simply jealous, I didn't believe her. The voice became taller and louder. It became a part of me. And since, I've not gone a day in my life without it. I began to lose weight by eighth grade. By then, my own insecurities have fed away on who I was. By then, eighth grade, my rapid weight loss began to show physically. My nails lost their pink color. My under eyes darkened. My hair thinned and began to fall out. I lost my period. I became cold and easily irritated all the time. But despite the multiple warnings displayed by my body or those around me, I sought something unattainable that was no longer tied to weight. There was no line drawn and no goals to be reached. My only plan was to keep going. And like that, before I knew it, I had jumped head first into a dark hole. But despite the multiple warning signs displayed by my body, which I still suffer today, only at the time I literally couldn't see them because of body dysmorphic disorder, which comes hand in hand with eating disorder. The crazy thing about this illness, it's like a blindness. It makes you ignorant of every red flag or warning sign. It's like a blindness that covers your eyes even when they're still wide open. Today, more than three years after this has passed, I still suffer from amenorrhea, a certain what if I can't have kids that disturbs my inner peace 
every time it crosses my mind. Eventually, I couldn't concentrate in school and had to be pulled out before finishing my last few months of boarding school. I missed prom and graduation and instead got to spend the rest of the school year and summer before freshman year in an eating disorder facility in New York City. Before being admitted though, I had to go through a certain set of tests for them to make sure that I was healthy enough for them to take responsibility of me. Basically, that I wasn't going to die on them. I remember this one particular one in the cardiologist. They had a big poster with colors on it. There's green at the top, yellow, orange, and red at the bottom. I was in the red by then, and the doctor assured me that I couldn't stay there for very long. I remember, and I remember this clearly, he said, the alternative is not staying here at all. At that moment, I turned to look at my mom who had come with me to this doctor's appointment. My mom was looking down on her phone, unable to meet my eyes. My mom, who I had the closest relationship to my whole life, felt further away than she ever had. And at that moment, I realized that this was the hardest thing I'd ever have to do and there was nothing anyone could say or do that would make it any easier. I got admitted into the facility and at first every day got a little worse. I came home and cried into my pillowcase until I fell asleep. My body was changing, my mind was pushing against it and I was caught in the middle of it. While at the facility, I had to reintroduce myself to the body I was giving to at birth but was never able to appreciate for what it is. And slowly, together with the weight, I regained strength, desire, spark, and light. I realized that the problem was not the way the mirror made my body look, it was how I looked at myself in that mirror. And suddenly I realized that the boundaries that kept me caged within four walls were only limits and rules that I had set up for myself and no one else. And they could be broken. And once I did, once I broke them, I was free to let go. Because my success is not tied to my weights. And my success is not tied to the way I look. Because calories won't change my life. But the decision to avoid them, the decision to remain in this illness, the decision to not fight back, and the decision to count meaningless numbers as if they somehow measure the weight of my worth, that would alter my life every time. The voice of pins appears again sometimes, only now I can't hear it. I no longer let the voice decide. Today, I am able to look back at this period in my life, glad I didn't give up, glad I gave myself the opportunity to heal. Today, I aspire to contribute to a world where people bring each other and themselves up, not tear each other and themselves down. Today, I no longer survive. Today, I live. Thank you.